Hello everyone and welcome to episode 18 of the Kara Khan vs Everything series where we play a 15 minute plus 10 second rapid game on chess.com. I try and explain my thought process while I play for entertainment but also to try and uh, educate you guys a bit more on my thought process while I play. I'm rated normally around 2000 so this is a bit of a rating climb account if you're not familiar with the series. And we play a Karo Khan setup as both the white and the black pieces, regardless of what my opponent plays. So we just get a better idea of how to play a Karo Khan structure in general and explore lots of the themes around it. With that being said, let's get into the game. All right, so we have the white pieces. So we're going to be starting with C3. Technically, this is known as the Saragossa opening. We're playing against Fred de Shehu from Italy. So I'm just going to double check. <laughs> I know Italy. I'm literally part Italian, so I don't know why I'm checking that. Um, so we're actually going to get what is a reverse Karo Khan, because my opponent plays e5. This is a Karo Khan, except my opponent is one move behind, because obviously I'm the white pieces, and normally the Karo is played with the black pieces. Knight c3 is an easy move to play, probably something like knight f3. And I think this actually transitions into a queen's gambit declined. So this position on the board is the same as if we would have gone something like d4, d5, c4, e6, takes, takes. That's the exact same position. I'll show you after the game, but it's a clear transposition. And I don't know the Queen's Gambit very well at all, but we have been transposing to a lot of these kinds of positions during this series. Check out the previous episodes in the playlist below after this video if you want. I'm gonna develop normally, knight f3, just, you know, take control of the central squares, right? And I'm thinking maybe I put the bishop on g5 to pin the knight. I'm expecting bishop to e7. But then once we get the bishop out, we can play e3, lock the pawn chain so the bishop is out before the pawn chain shuts, get our other bishop to d3 probably to look at this nice diagonal, and castle, maybe put a knight on e5 in the future. That looks pretty good to me. It looks pretty good. We could also always put a knight on e5 if we want, but there's no need to do that yet, I don't think. Um, we could try doing some kind of minority attack on the queen side. But for now, I think we just keep things nice and clean. Okay, bishop g4. Let's start with h3. Just ask him the question. I expect him to retreat, but you might as well ask. Like, there's no harm in asking. G5 is actually quite tempting here. Sorry, G4 even. To kick the bishop back to G6 and then play knight to E5. It's very tempting. But okay, say we play G4, bishop G6, knight E5, knight D7. I don't think I want to take the bishop and allow H takes G6 to open his rook up. I don't think I want to do that. So we can hold off on it. We could just go bishop to e2. Keep things nice and easy. Um, queen b3 is an interesting idea. Because if bishop f3, I think we might be able to take on b7. Yeah, I think so. So queen b3 is quite a nice idea to try and break the pin. And then let's say my opponent goes like queen c7, then we can play knight e5 because there's no longer a pin. So we don't have to include g4 is the point, because g4 is obviously weakening. If queen b3, queen b6, offering a queen trade, knight e5, if my opponent trades, I know we have doubled isolated pawns, but I think it benefits us because we open up our rook and we have some active pieces there. Also, if my opponent does take, I can just take back with the g-pawn and keep my king in the center of the board or go queenside and try and take advantage of the g-file. So I'm going to go queen b3 because if my opponent ends up taking, even if I don't have tactics against him, and he does, then I can always open up the g-file for myself. But the question is whether I can take on b7. If queen b7, let's say the bishop retreats, I just take the rook, right? That's nice and easy. 
Queen b7, if he desperados on g2, I'm going to have to take him. And then knight d7, queen c6. That's hard to judge. It's hard to judge that position. I could... It might be the wisest option just to take back. Also, if I go queen b7, knight d7, gf3, rook b8, queen a7, rook b2, or queen c6, I suppose. I don't like the fact that the rook can infiltrate. So I'm actually just going to take on f3. I also cover the e4 square really nicely with the f-pawn which means it's difficult for my opponent to try putting a knight on e4. I know I'm controlling it with a knight right now, but just for future reference. And this is quite an interesting position because we damage our structure, but we open up the g-file. And a very big part of me wants to go queen c2 right now and say, look, you've just created a massive problem in your position by opening the g-file. I'm trying to attack you now, and therefore I don't want to trade queens. That's very, very tempting. I know it technically wastes a move, because I went queen b3 and back to c2, but I also encouraged my opponent to take by doing that. And to be fair, the queen on b6 is only really attacking b2, and if my queen is defending b2, cancels out. If I'm going to put a bishop on d3 as well, I can line up a nice battery. I can also castle queenside as well, because my king will then defend b2. I know I have, I know the uh, c file is a bit weak, and c5 could be an option at some point. But for now, if c5 and something like bishop f6, bishop f6, knight d5, that's a bit of a problem for my opponent. Okay, h6. I don't want to take right now. Um, I want to keep the tension. If I go to h4. G5, I just go to G3, and then I've got access to squares like E5, which is pretty good. I could go to F4 straight away. But I think if I'm going to put the bishop on this diagonal rather than this diagonal, right, then I want to induce the move G5 so I can try and strike with moves like H4 and F4. I think that makes sense. Maybe the point is, oh, no, I, I was trying to look at things like knight e4 with, like, tactics, because if knight e4 the first time, then after knight e4, my knight defends my bishop, but if my bishop's on h4, it doesn't, but I don't think those tactics work for my opponent. Okay, rook g1 looks pretty good to me. My opponent might be trying to castle queenside, but I have, uh, you know, a nice a-pawn to throw down the board, potentially. Also, this diagonal will be quite weak. I can take advantage of that. I have the bishop pair, which could be useful. Although the board is a bit closed for the moment. Um, rook g1 is the most natural move, in my opinion. Just getting on the open g file. Attacking an undefended pawn. So I think I shouldn't... So, so I, I, I don't think I should uh, waste too much time considering that decision. Because, I mean, it's just a very easy move to play. And it can't be a bad move, just attacking a weak pawn. If my opponent goes g5 to attack my bishop and defend the pawn, then that's a pretty major weakness. Like, the pawn on g5. And he does it. Okay. Obviously, I have to retreat. But this diagonal is pretty good if my opponent goes queenside, which he does. Which he does. Okay. Huh, interesting. The question is whether I castle queenside or not. And I don't think I want to. I might actually just hide my king over on the king side, potentially. A4 looks very tempting to try and barrel down on the A file. Because if I get A6 in, then I undermine the B7 pawn, which could weaken the C6 pawn. And because the king can't go to C7 or B8, that pawn will probably be pinned for a very long time. Um, if, like, I move my knight with tactics, potentially. Once the queen moves, obviously. If, um... I, th I think a4 is a good move, because a5 with tempo and then a6 is a bit of a threat. I can always lift my rook 
Okay, not like that, because the bishop controls that square. But it opens up my other rook as well. My king's a bit weak, but it's hard for my opponent to actually access it. I always leave the option open of castling queenside as well, as long as I don't move this rook. So a4 looks pretty damn good to me. His minor pieces don't really coordinate with each other that well. My bishop's cutting off his bishop's movement. My pawn is restricting this knight's movement. And he goes a5. He goes for it. Okay. Now knight b5 is an option. Because, again, the pawn is pinned. And then I'm threatening moves like bishop to c7, which are kind of crazy. He would get this check. But king d1? Looks pretty good. Also, if my opponent isn't careful, then knight a7 would be mate, which would be awesome. That looks like a really good move to me. Really good move. I'm trying to consider alternatives. I'd love to play this, but the knight controls that square. So I can't do that, unfortunately. But it also ties this knight down for now. Rook c1 is playable, just to put more pressure on the file. But I don't think it's necessary. Does knight b5 carry a threat? Yes. The threat is bishop to c7. Okay. So can he defend that? Did he go queen a6? Yeah, but then knight d6 check wins the queen. So knight b5 looks really good. His queen only has these two safe squares, but they're both vulnerable. Yeah, he plays bishop to b4, which is kind of as expected, but it doesn't actually solve any of his problems because I think I just go king d1. And, um,. He's got a bit of a problem here because my bishops are just sniping him. My knight is deep in his territory. His king can't move and my queen is pinning the pawn. He's just so restricted in this position. C5? Is that an option? I could... Make discoveries with knight to d6 because the bishop wouldn't be controlling the square anymore. Oh, that's a nice move. I did not consider that. Yeah, because I no longer have knight d5 now. I mean, clearly my opponent is very much on the back foot, but there's no immediate way in. Rook c1 is a decent looking move. I don't know if it accomplishes that much though. Um, I still can't make this work. I'd need to deflect the queen somehow. I don't know how I would do that. Maybe I can just play rook c1 and just continue to improve my position. There's no threat with it though. There's no threat. Bishop d3 maybe looking at the f5 square to apply more pressure. Hmm a move. I don't know if it's that good of a move, though. But then how does my opponent improve? These pieces can't really move. The queen can't move. The rook can't move. The king can't move. The bishop hasn't really got anywhere useful to go. And the rook is just trapped in the corner. So, what's his plan? H4 could be played at some point. Maybe. Maybe with the idea to go bishop to h3. Uh, I don't know. It's a, I'm thinking of like something like this and then bishop to e5 because the knight would be pinned. But that's just a one move threat. That's not that substantial, I don't think. We clearly have a better position, but I need to figure out how to convert this. Because it's not obvious to me. Hmm. 
Bishop d3 and rook c1 are the moves that I want to play. Maybe they're interchangeable, but I don't know. Bishop d3 looks more natural. I think I should... Mm. But then if I go rook c1, then I could go queen to f5. To start putting some pressure because the rook would be pinning the pawn. So rook c1 first might make more sense to relieve the queen of her duty of pinning the pawn. Rook c1. I don't know what my opponent would even do. I don't know. Like, rook f8? Um... I guess. Queen f5 puts a lot of pressure on. But again, I don't know if it carries a threat or not. Huh, it's a tough position. Very tough position. Okay, let's play rook c1. I think... My opponent can't really do a whole lot. I think I have some clear ways that I can improve my position. I don't think my opponent can really stop me. So I think I should just improve. This position would be a fair bit easier if my king was over on the king's side. But it's not. And at the end of the day, I can't have everything in the position. Like, my king is a bit weird on d1, but it's not actually vulnerable. I suppose c5 is less viable with my rook on c1 as well, because I'm thinking that could be a way for my opponent to try and break out. I don't even know if I would take or not. If takes... something like knight takes... Again, my opponent's in a weird position. Queen f5 might be an idea. It might be a good plan to get my queen to f5 soon. So that I can stop his knight from helping out in a potential c5 push. That might be the way that my opponent breaks out of this position. It's the most obvious pawn break. Okay, I don't think f6 does anything. It controls e5. I don't want to go there anyway. It just weakens more light squares. And stops his knights from coming to f6 in the future. So I think that's actually good for me. The question is, do I want my queen on f5? Or do I want to play my bishop d3 and then f5? I suppose e4 might be a move in the future. With the idea of trying to play d5. My opponent still can't block my bishop, which is a massive trump card of my position. Bishop d3, I think, is better with the plan to go to f5. I relinquish defense of the knight. Is that a big deal? Would I rather queen f5 and bishop d3? I don't know. I suppose queen f5 would stop c5 because d5 pawn would hang. Okay, I, I have to decide. Do I want my bishop on f5 or my queen on f5? That's the question. I mean, I could also consider bishop d3 to g6 to take the knight so that I can play bishop to c7. That's also an idea. But then if I take the knight, then the rook can take. Which means bishop c7 wouldn't... I suppose it would work, because queen a6 would have to be played. But then my bishop wouldn't be controlling the a6 square anymore, so it wouldn't work anyway. It wouldn't even work. Uh, I'm just going to play bishop d3, because I actually can't decide. I feel like this is the safer option. I don't know whether I should be playing safe, though. But it just develops another piece, right? I can actually run my king over as well if I want to. Which is a nice option to have. But again, I don't know what my opponent does. He's just really, really cramped. 
really cramped in this position, and I don't know how he makes any progress, because, okay, this knight can't really do anything. This knight is stuck. The queen can't move. The bishop can't really do anything. This doesn't do anything. This doesn't do anything. And obviously d6 is not accessible. The rook can't do anything that useful with these squares. And the rook on d8 is just trapped because of these pieces. The king can't move. The only pawn on the queen side that can move is the c pawn. But that seems to just create more problems than it solves. The king side pawns, I mean, you can't do this. You can't do this. If you do this, it doesn't really do anything. Because if I go bishop 2f5, then g4 is not a threat. And if you try and go h5, h4, then I just retreat the bishop. And you accomplish nothing. So I think we're doing a very good job of restricting my opponent. This is definitely more so my playstyle, just to be very restrictive. Um, not everyone plays like this, of course, but I personally like to squeeze my opponent's position to a point where they just have no viable plans. You could argue it's playing too safe, and maybe I had a better win at some point, but this is just kind of how I play chess. Oh, also, I don't know why I said Rook 2h7 was playable, because you literally can't go there. So, you actually only have two moves with the Rook. And I think this is what my opponent is realising. Like, he has no moves. And things could get very bad for him. I would love to be able to deflect this Queen from the defence of A7, because Knight A7 is just checkmate. D6 is not accessible, because he has too many defenders there. Um, and even if, I don't know, I don't know why the Bishop or the Knight would ever move, but you could always just take my Knight if I did it. And I don't want to exchange my knight off because it's an amazing piece. Like, it's just so, so good. So restrictive. Blocks the B-file for my opponent's queen as well. Gets rid of counterplay. And just has way too many threats in the position. Just a very nice piece. But yeah, knight a7. <sighs> like, I was thinking about sacrificing on c6 to deflect the queen. But I don't think it works because you can just take with the pawn. And if you take with the pawn, then you get the b7 square. So this is no longer mate because you have an escape route. The plan might have to be e4. It might not have to be yet. I don't think I have to rush it. But e4 might be the plan. With the point that you have to take me. Otherwise I take you and you can't take back because of the pin. And if you do take me, then I take back and I'm going to play d5 regardless. Yeah, like I said, h5 only does it only does something if g4 can be played. Even then, it's not that good. But if I do bishop 2, f5, I don't think there's any threat. Also, you can't play knight g7 to attack my bishop, because then you relinquish defense of c7. So I think you just lose. I think. I could consider going h4. But I don't see the need to allow pawn breaks unnecessarily. I think this is a good move. I'm not 100% sure. My only concern of it is my opponent now could play queen a6. Uh, because this wouldn't be a threat. But I don't see how that actually helps him, other than just wasting another move. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Also, if queen a6 is played, the queen takes her eyes off of d4, which might make e4 easier to play. Maybe. Like I said, dream scenario is my king is on a square like h1, and I can play d. I, I can play e4 with no concern whatsoever because my king king is nice and safe. My issue is, if I go e4, this is kind of scary. And like, this is a little bit scary. And I know my knight defends d4. But I don't want him to be able to create counterplay. And again, that might be a weakness of my game where I'm too obsessed with my opponents potentially creating counterplay that I just play a suboptimal move. But 
Okay, he actually plays knight g7. Right, so what if I go bishop c7? You you have to move the queen, so queen a6. You now have that square because my bishop is on f5. I could retreat the bishop to d3, which would force the queen. Or would it? Could you take the knight? If bishop c7, queen a6, bishop d3, take. Can you do that? I could take the rook with check. Hmm. Queen goes to a6. I don't have to do that, of course. I could do something else. I could just take the rook. I think I have to do this. And my bishop's always defended anyway. I think worst case scenario is I win an exchange. And I mean, in a position like this, where I'm positionally dominant as it is, then going up an exchange would just be game over, surely. And he sacks the queen. Wow. Okay, well, obviously we take it. And this is just a queen for two minor pieces, which is completely winning. Or it should be. <laughs> it should be. Now, how to convert? H5 looks tempting. I think I should play it. The king probably belongs on e2. I think I want him to take my bishop so my queen can infiltrate. I think. Yeah, let's go h4. He obviously can't take because his knight hangs. This bishop I don't think is doing that much because, I mean, the, it hasn't really got any targets, right? And I've got a strong dark squared pawn presence as well. I could have taken this knight, but I don't see the point. Let's take here. We now are technically threatening queen d5 because the c pawn is pinned. We have pressure on g5, f6. Okay, he retreats the bishop. Surely I take on d5. And then I'm threatening a5. Right? You could try a fancy trick like knight c5, but then just queen f7, and he's in a world of hurt. So, that looks good to me. Let's do it. The reason I say knight c5 is because I can't take the knight because my queen is under attack, and the knight also blocks my queen's access to the a5 pawn, which was my next target. So that's why I mentioned that move. Okay. He moves the king. Makes sense. Um, queen b3 is safe. Something like king e6. I don't know. Maybe queen f7 is better. Leave the king on a vulnerable square and cause some problems. Queen e6. Let's say rook e8. Mm. I am winning. Oh, this also attacks h5, which would be good. So let's go queen f7 instead. I am low on time, so I might not be able to speak quite as much as I have been for the um, other half of the game. But I'll do my best. Bishop's under attack, f6 is pressured, it's well defended though, g5 is still pressured, don't forget, and h5 is under attack. I can always evacuate my queen on b3 with tempo if I need it, which is why I didn't do that first. I want the option to escape with a check, um, just because it will save me a tempo potentially. Again, king e2 is a move that I want to play, but currently I have a queen for two minor pieces, and I'm up a pawn. So, a queen for a bishop a knight and a pawn. No, a queen and a pawn for a bishop and a knight, sorry. So, this is obviously completely winning, but I need to prove it. 
I need to try and activate my rooks, potentially try and expose my opponent's king. My rooks are currently disconnected, so I need to try and do something about that. King e2 is something that I need to play. I want to try and open the g-file to get my rook involved on the second rank, uh, which would be lovely. My opponent can't take yet, of course, because his bishop's under attack, but it's something that I would like to achieve. Also, if we trade pawns on the g-file, then my e-pawn becomes a passer, which would be pretty good. I don't think I can push it through yet, and it would also weaken my king, because e2 is a square I want to put the king on. And if I start advancing the pawn, then the file could become weak. So I need to take that into account. I could put the king on b1, actually, which would be safer. Worth considering. Okay, let's start by taking, just to be easy. Again, maybe it's not the best idea, but I've done it now. I can consider this, but I don't think it's that good. I'm going to put the king on e2 to defend f3. My opponent can't do this because the bishop hangs. And if he does this, then the h-pawn hangs. Okay, yeah, he's pushing. I didn't really consider that as well as I should have. Let's go d5. I want to try and break open his king. That looks like a good idea to me. I mean, if the pawn gets through, I just go rook h1. And I suppose I tie down his rook with my rook. Which is fine. My king is nice and protected by these pawns. Also when a light square so the bishop can't access the king. If my opponent pushes, I get a pass d pawn. And I think d6 is very lethal. Because the bishop's under attack. If the bishop moves, the knight hangs. This rook can move now though. Because the h pawn isn't um, undefended. Because it's advanced. But if the rook moves, then it becomes harder to push the h-pawn because it's got no support. And the yeah, f-file is well protected by my king. Even if I end up losing a pawn, it's not the end of the world. I just need to try and activate my pieces because I have a queen, but the queen wants the board to be nice and open so she can make use of her ability to maneuver very, very well. Like, that's the whole point of the queen. To move from side to side um, diagonals as much as she wants really, really quickly. That's why she's powerful. So the more open squares I can create by trading pawns, opening pawn structures up, the better she becomes, essentially. And same goes for my rooks. The more files I can open, the more ranks I can open up, the rooks become better. So I want to do that. Let's take, attack the knight, pressure on a5, pressure on b7. Um, queen b5 is a potential to forcefully win the a pawn. And then we have some tricks of like queen b5, king a7, queen a5, king a7, queen c7, something like king a8. And we can maybe try and push the a pawn to open up the king's position fully. Those ideas exist. Hmm. This looks pretty good. I don't think my opponent should have traded. I was expecting him to go c5 to try and keep everything shut. But d6 might have won anyway. Hmm. d6, maybe something like knight e5. Ah, but then queen b3. And my whole idea of keeping the b3 square open with a check for my queen to evacuate at any time would come in perfectly. Because knight e5 would have come with tempo. But it wouldn't have mattered because I can evacuate with check and then win the bishop. So I didn't obviously plan that, but I was like, okay, I can evacuate with check whenever I want. So it leaves more tactical options open in the future. And there it would have done so. Again, it's partially luck, but you create your own luck in chess. You know, that's how chess works. And I don't know what my opponent should do here because something like rook d8 defending the knight loses instantly to queen e6. Double attack because the bishop's no longer defended. Maybe the knight can move to a square like c5? That's kind of annoying. Although, rook g5 can be played, because if you take, then I take and then take, and you lose. So knight c5 might not be that good. 
I think I can just take on g5. And you just keep all your problems. Essentially. And then if you play something like rook to c8, I can always sack. Oh no, I can't actually. What am I on about? Okay, let's take on g5. Like I said, you can't take here because I pick up the knight with check and then pick up the bishop and your counterplay is gone. And he does it. That's wonderful for us. Absolutely perfect. Makes this an easy conversion. He didn't have to do that. But it wasn't obvious what he was going to do. I think after king a6, we can be a bit more accurate as well. I think we can give a check first. Force the king to a7. Give another check. Win another pawn. Um, yeah. Take a check. The king is forced back. And then we take the bishop. And now we have a queen for a rook. And we have like three extra pawns. So this is all good. Yeah, he can push this pawn, but it's not the end of the world at all. I want to be accurate, but I think the best idea is just to block the pawn. He has no counterplay. Because this rook is now tied down to the defense of the h3 pawn. And we can actually just take it now. Because queen to g3 wins the rook back if he takes. So, again, a nice little tactical flurry at the end with a few rook sacks, um, which, I mean, is pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Um, that doesn't do anything because we take the rook and you can't take the queen because of the pin. So you have to take the rook back. And then you actually lose even more because queen e5 check picks up the rook. So, yeah, completely game over in this situation. And obviously, this is the easiest endgame to convert ever. Um, I suppose if this pawn was off the board, it would be even easier, but, like, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, a very clean win. I think we could have a very nice accuracy score. And, I mean, a Queen's Gambit declined is essentially what this game was. It was pretty fun, to be fair. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I would encourage you to stick around for the analysis, but if you're not interested in that, fair enough. Check out the playlist below for all the previous episodes of the Cairo Khan vs. Everything Speedrun. I think you'll enjoy them if you enjoyed this. For those of you who want to stick around for the analysis, let's get into that now. Okay, so firstly, well played to my opponent. Um, considering, like, he's 1640, that's not low rated, but it's lower rated than I actually am, and he played very well that game. He had 75.1% accuracy, I had 86.5. Let's get into the analysis. Of course, we have a reverse Karo Khan. We have an exchange, d5, knight c3. What I was saying is that this is a transposition for the queen's gambit declined, where if d4, d5, c4, e6, takes, takes happens, this is the exact same position as this. Uh, this, sorry. This is the same position, but you can see by the yellow um, squares indicating what the last move was, they're different move orders. Same position, though. I have no idea about queen's gambit decline theory, but I just play normal moves that I would play in the Cairo Khan, since this is similar to a Cairo Khan. I have 6, knight f3, c6, bishop g5, all very normal. e3, bishop g4, which wasn't actually perfect. And after h3, g4 was actually a good move. And I knew this existed, but I was trying to make knight e5 work. And after knight bd7, black kind of diffuses the situation. What I should have tried to play was takes, takes, h4, and try and go after the bishop. And if h6, trade the bishops, knight d7, and then I castle queenside, queen e7. Ah, okay, I'm trying to play things like g5. Interesting. Anyway, I go queen b3, which is a good move. And I expected queen b6, to be honest. I was considering the move knight e5. My opponent could trade. This would be decent. The computer actually just wants me to retreat, which is difficult to do, especially because after bishop g6, I kind of have to do this. Rook b1, queen a3, and then take on b7. Eh, I suppose this looks like quite a good position. My opponent took on f3, and basically, I wasn't sure if queen b7 worked, 
because of bishop g2. And after bishop g2, knight bd7, queen c6, something like rook c8, I wasn't sure. Apparently this is just very winning for white, but it's always difficult to know when it's a poison pawn situation or not. Like, it's hard to tell, because my opponent could always play by a different move order. Instead of taking on g2, you go knight bd7, take, rook b8, and then after... Well, queen a7, white loses the advantage, and I considered this, right? So I instead have to go queen c6, and, you know, rook b2 is scary. The computer doesn't think so, because I can not take with the knight, because I can't. I do this, and I'm just up two pawns, and I don't care. But, like, the computer's a computer, and it's not emotional, it has no fear. I have fear. So, I take the safer option. Not necessarily the best move, but an easy move. After queen b6, queen c2 is the best move by far. So, I'm very happy that I found that. Because I don't want to trade queens with my opponent. I've just doubled my pawns on the king side to allow me to open up the g-file. So if my opponent castles king side, I want to be able to attack him. And to be fair, I did attack him in the game. And having the queen was very, very useful. Because she held down the c-file for me. h6, I retreat the bishop. Knight bd7, rook g1, g5 is a mistake. So yeah, I didn't think it was the best. My opponent's supposed to castle though, and that is so difficult to do. Just castling into the line of fire. Like, look at all this. My bishop's probably going to come to d3. I suppose the point is there's no pawn break for me on the g file, but this is still tough to do, and white is still better. So g5, retreat the bishop, castle. The issue my opponent created for himself is he can't challenge my bishop, because this bishop can't get to d6 which means his king can't move, and it just created problems for him. I went a5, which is a mistake. Okay, but only for a very weird reason. I would encourage you to try and find the reason that a5 is not the best plan of action. This is really tough to see, so like, very well done if you can find it. I don't think I would have found it. The move is queen a5. And the point is, I'm supposed to play a3 to go b4 and b5 to stop queen a5. Because if queen a5 is played, I can't advance my a-pawn. And my attack fizzles out. If I try knight b5, then I'm just pinned, so I can't even do that. But my opponent goes a5, which is the more natural move, I think. I go knight b5, which is a slight inaccuracy. Bishop d3 and castle queenside were better, but it's still good. Bishop b4, king d1. Best response. Of course, you don't want to go king to e2 and block your bishop. Knight to e8, I think was the only move. Yeah, the only move that doesn't lose. Because let's say you do something like this. Then bishop c7 attacks the queen. The queen sacrifices herself or goes to a6. And then knight d6 check, bishop d6, bishop a6, king c7. And then like, I don't know. Actually, rook c1's better because you can't take the bishop because of queen c6. But even something like bishop d3 and white is up a queen for two minor pieces, which is what happened in the game. So knight e8, rook c1, which was actually the best move. I consider queen f5, it's the second best move. Bishop d3 isn't quite as good. h4 is also good, which I did consider, but I thought was unnecessary. So yeah, I'm very happy with how I played this. Rook c1, f6, bishop d3. I think that's still better than queen f5. Although they're both good. Bishop d3, h5, bishop f5. Part of the point was to stop g4. Knight g7 is played. And then I go for the kill with bishop to c7. Knight c7 is apparently better, and I have no idea why. Is this the point? What happens if you do this? Okay. Why is black losing so badly? I think just because of d5. And the knight is pinned, so the rook can't defend it. And once I take on d5, you have a lot of problems, I guess. And the computer wants to sack the queen. Let's say h4, knight d5. Queen a7. Bishop h2. 
I don't know, rookie eight. And I just slow play the position with rook c2. And all black can do is shuffle. Literally, the computer wants black to shuffle. And then I'm going to double up. Wow. And then I'm threatening rook takes, right? Rook takes, b takes, rook takes, queen c7, and it's game over. I suppose you can do this, but you still lose. That is crazy. And to be fair, that was my game plan, to make it so my opponent couldn't move. And the computer found a better way to do that than I did, but I still did pretty well. Bishop c7. If queen a6, I wanted to play bishop to d3, but I was concerned about cb5. But then I realized I can take on d8 with check if king to d8. Queen c8, king e7, and I win the rook. Tough to calculate, but that was my plan. That was my plan. My concern was, after this, um, is that my knight can be taken because my bishop's on c7, which means the pawn isn't pinned to the king. But this is the way to do it, to take like this. I could also do bishop b5, which I did consider. And let's say the queen tries to save herself, then you still just lose horrifically. Oh, I can actually take on d7 in this variation as well, which is even worse. So, because this is just checkmate. So, you know, my opponent took, which might have been the most pragmatic choice. Knight takes, king takes, h4. We try and create some problems, trade a few pieces. Queen d5, of course, playing on the pin. King b6. And I did not want to go queen b3 yet. I go queen f7, which is the best move, which I'm very happy about. Uh, rook d2 e8 takes takes king e2 h4 d5 and i expected my opponent to go c5 here d6 was my idea you can't take because of takes and knight to e5 doesn't work attacking my queen because i was going to play queen b3 check king moves and i take the bishop so that was why i left the option of queen b3 open my opponent took queen e6 check first was apparently no, it wasn't better. Queen takes is better. Knight c5. And fair play, my opponent blocks a few checks with the knight. I find rook g5, which is the second best move in the position. b4 is slightly better. Because if a b4. There, there. And I deflect the king. If the king goes to b5, then I take on b7. And apparently you just lose. Oh, if you do this, you get mated. So you have to give up the bishop. Or you run closer, and then I win anyway. Interesting. My opponent took, though. And of course, that was a deflection tactic, because you can't defend the knight and the pawn at the same time. And I'm applying more pressure. So let's say something like rook c8 was played. My initial idea was um, rook takes, I think. It's unnecessary. Rook g7 is better, actually. Just attacking more things. But rook c5 is still decent. I think this was the most resilient my opponent could have been. He said took, which made my job very easy. Queen c5, king a6, queen b5, king a7. Rook c7 apparently just wins by force. Oh, because here you lock your escape route and get mated. I didn't realize that. Regardless, it's still completely winning. We take on g5, h3. I put my rook on h1, and here I just use more tactics. Rook e to g8 is played. I suppose queen e5 is, can be played immediately, but it doesn't matter. Queen e5 is played regardless. The king moves, I win the rook, and obviously this is completely game over. So... The Karo Khan turns into a Queen's Gambit declined. We get a very clean win, some nice tactics in there, and a very nice sort of positional attacking game. I hope you guys enjoyed. Like I said, check out the playlist below for the previous episodes and the other um, videos that I've made in the Karo Khan. And all of them will be linked in the playlist below, so I'd encourage you to check those out. I'll see you in the next video.